It's November 29th. We are here at Decipher Algorand's crypto conference, and I am joined by Bruno Souza of Hashdex. Great to have you here. How are you doing? Great. A pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about Hashdex. What are you? What do you do? So Hashdex started five years ago with the idea of creating a bridge between traditional finance and crypto uh, through funds and ETFs, regulator funds and ETFs. We always had inside uh, ETFs at the time the U.S., Actually, still today, you can have spot crypto ETFs. We started with uh, private funds in the US and Brazil. Uh, eventually, we spent more energy in Brazil. And uh, in 2021, we launched the first crypto ETF in the world uh, and, uh, and then listed it in, in several exchanges in Bermuda and Brazil. Uh, and we also have ETPs in Europe and in the US, a 33 Act Bitcoin futures ETF uh, with some partners there at Tilcrim and Toroso. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're global asset manager, focus 100% in crypto, crypto baskets, especially crypto indices, and just crypto, not crypto companies, actual tokens. Yeah, yeah and we're not talking, oh, you get to have an ETF that owns Meta or Facebook. It's actual crypto assets. It's actual crypto assets. So you look, for instance, at Web311, which is one of the ETFs that we have. It's a layer one ETF, and then you're seeing all layer one different layer one projects with different weights, uh, depending on their market cap and other factors. Uh, but you want to get exposure to layer one projects. You believe this is a big thing. You don't know what to choose. You buy the ETF like you would if you were investing in a market that you don't really know or that, that's very fluid. Uh, the best way to get exposure is through an index. Right. So if you want to own crypto, there's D DeFi, there's CeFi, which is uh, on exchanges, and then what you're, it's, it's a very institutional product to own it via exchange traded fund. Like you could own it in a the same account theoretically that you own a stock or something like that. Uh, exchange traded fund, trust, private funds, and then exchange traded products. I feel like in America, the holy grail is an exchange traded fund, which is a key property of which is that uh, at the end of the day, it's it's um, you can you can you can. Um, redeem it and, and get the key assets, whereas something like, let's say, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust does not have that. So Grayscale Bitcoin Trust has spread wildly from a, a trading at a 100% premium to its net asset value to now trading at close to a 50% discount to its, its net asset value. Um, yeah, do you, how much do you value the role of it being an ETF? What are your plans to convert some of your trust to an ETF? And to the extent that you already have ETFs that are listed in Brazil, uh, how did you get that? Is it just because it's more of a friendly regulatory environment than the U.S.? Yeah, it's uh, the U.S. fell behind the regulation. That's a fact. Uh, we developed that in working with the regulators, not only in Brazil, but in Europe, too, over the years. And, you know, when we launched the first one, it took us almost two, two and a half years sitting down with the regulator, the stock exchange, explaining what we wanted to do. And although ETFs are the means, uh, the preferred means of access for institutional investors, they also are for the majority of retail. You know, make no mistake, my father is not opening an account in a crypto exchange. It's not going to work. But if you're connected to, to any broker dealer, your home broker, then you have access to, you know, different array of funds, including uh, ETFs, including then crypto ETFs. Uh, in the U.S., of course, there's this, you know, anomaly of having different product structures, but not having the actual spot product. Uh, so we, we do have... Uh, in partnership with Teo Crimin Toro, so the uh, Bitcoin Futures ETF uh, with uh, the wrapper, with the 33 Act. So that's the only one that has this wrapper, uh, which we believe is the right wrapper for a conversion to spot. Uh, some point when things become more clear and regulatory-wise, we feel this is something that's still going to take maybe a year or more, given the scenario of regulation in the U.S. today. So there's a 33 wrapper and then the 40 wrapper. What are the difference between them? What are, what's the wrapper of some other funds and why do you think 33 is the way to go? So a key difference is a 40 act uh, structure, you can only hold securities and the 33 act structure is more flexible. You can have commodities, you can have, so if you look at, for instance, uh, agricultural uh, ETF CTPs, they're usually under the 33 act uh, structure. So like a USO, owes U.S. oil futures, probably in a 33. If you're buying futures, it's okay. You can be either 33 uh, or 44. Uh, or 40. But if you're buying a commodity, uh, you know, gold uh, yeah, yeah, ETF, okay. for instance, if you're buying physical mm -hmm. gold, you can't have it under, under you know, a structure that requires securities because, of course, gold is not a security. Since we know Bitcoin is not a security, 
It doesn't fit into the 40 act structure, but it does fit into the 33 act structure, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so uh, the one that we launched, uh, the hash hashtag Bitcoin Futures uh, ETF, that was the first under that wrapper. It's the only one. And we believe it's the, the right wrapper uh, for when the time comes to, to have actual spot inside. Mm, and yeah, what's the... How do you see the value of a spot ETF versus a futures ETF? I know there's one thing, which is the technical aspect of maybe you're paying roll and on some like commodity ETF that can be quite extreme. But, you know, I mean, we, we may, there may be some parties in, in centralized CFI crypto that we may not trust. And we'll get onto that in a moment. But, you know, the CME, they have Bitcoin exchanges like Bitcoin's probably going to be there. Like, wh what do you see as the value of a spot versus futures? Well, spot is, is the actual final product, right? The, the, the futures, there are uh a means of getting to an end which has exposure to that uh specific asset and the market that you have access to when you're investing in spot is the actual full bitcoin market and not just the the market out bitcoin futures because that's a separate market with different liquidity with different limits of exposure and things like that right so we saw when the first 40 act uh, etfs of that type were launched in the us you had things like contango, you know, problems mm -hmm. with rolling contracts and things like that. It, it has a higher cost uh, than than uh, than a, a spot product. And you know, it's uh, if you can have spot, why not? The second thing is that although you have the futures contracts in the U.S. for Bitcoin and Ether, you only have that uh, that those the ETFs for Bitcoin. Even for Ether, you don't have them. When you go into baskets, uh, you're not going to have all those those uh, futures contracts for the different strategies you want to build, right? So like we have DeFi indices, we, uh, ETFs uh, in, in other countries, Web3, Metaverse, Momentum. Mm -hmm. These are all different strategies that you're not going to have futures in the CMEs for mm -hmm. all of them. Yeah, you might yeah. have for a couple, right? So when you open up, uh, you know, the access to spot, you can create several different investment strategies, which is what investors want in the end. And when you're constructing a basket or an index to invest in, let's say a DeFi index or a layer one index, mm -hmm. how do you select which ones are in there? I mean, it's just based on the, the biggest market cap. And also, how do you choose the weightings? Because, you know, I worked at some really talented people on my team at the research team, very into crypto. And they say, oh, this this protocol, is, it's not that good. It, it shouldn't be in an index. But then mm -hmm. if you follow my colleague's advice, you know, you may have clients saying, why isn't this thing in, not in it? So, so how yeah. do you choose uh, the weighting and how do you choose which is in it? Yeah, you're, you're always going to have some <laughs> uh, complaints. <laughs> in the indexes uh, is a very interesting thing because depending on the way you build them, they can come out totally different. So uh, we, we co-develop a NASDAQ crypto index with, with NASDAQ. That, that's our flagship uh, product uh, is, is the product that in, the products that invest in, in, in that index. And it has a very interesting construction, although it is market cap weighted, it has several other uh, filters and criteria to make sure that what comes out in the end is what represents sort of, you know, the, the most important projects in crypto. And you're applying different filters. Uh, so you start with, a, you know, uh, an exchange filter. In what, so, you know, crypto is very hard to define. What is a crypto asset? That, that can, you know, uh, depending on the definition, you can get to 10,000, 20,000 assets. Right. So uh, how do you narrow down that? So let's look at the good exchanges. So the exchanges that are regulated, that have, you know, pay levels of K, KYC, ML, NML, AML, and so on and so forth. Uh, you narrow down and say, okay, what are the assets traded in those exchanges? Oh, so that's the universe. What are the assets that have institutional custody? Because you need proper custody, you can't do that in-house, otherwise you're taking risks, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so, you know, you start applying all these rules and then you have uh, uh, a volume rule, how, mu how much it represents in the market in terms of trading, until you get to market cap too, right? Um, so it is market cap weighted a little bit? It is, yeah, yeah, okay. it is, but it has all the, these other filters. That's in the NASA crypto index. When you're looking at the other indices, Similar constructions with different, uh, you know, s sometimes you can have different weights or, or, or limits uh, depending on the strategy that, that the index is, is going to follow. So if you look, some of ETFs track uh, indices d designed by CF benchmarks, you look at the Web3 uh, index, there are different limits there for you to capture the whole thing. If you just kept it market cap, Ethereum would be most of the index. It, it would be very big, right? So right. you put a cap there uh, and you get more exposure to other assets. Uh, you look directly at layer one in, in the DeFi index, for instance, you get 
uh, you know, a layer one, let's say a layer one players, but also direct DeFi projects. So you can have a mix. If DeFi grows, uh, Ethereum probably grows too, right? So it depends on what you want to do with the index and what type of exposure you want to get. And that's a lot uh, for the index uh, provider to, to manufacture sometimes uh, with uh, an asset manager like us when you're building a product together. And then you get to a result. But you know, to your point, yeah. you're always going to see the client saying, why is this not there? I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. On the NCI, we never had Terra. We never That's had good. Terra. Okay, so uh, at, you know, imagine this uh, a year ago, people were like, oh, why isn't Terra in the end? This is the third largest in market cap. So no, it's not, it's not passing the tests. And people, oh, then the index doesn't work. Well, the index was designed to keep out stuff that doesn't work mm -hmm. or that doesn't make sense. Another example, none of our indices ever had FTT in them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means the index construction is done in a way that you can sit down with an institutional allocator or a gatekeeper and say, this is well built. If you look under the hood, you're going to see that there's real, there's real logic and intelligence here, uh, which is different than saying, I'm getting the 100 largest crypto assets and putting yeah. it in there. Right? That's... Uh not getting FTT, that's that's very good. Um, I guess so the question is, so you say when you didn't have Terra, Terra was the stable coin. Do you not include any stable coins or you do? Terra or Luna, we, we, we don't include stable coins. Okay. In, uh, because the stable coin uh, in, in the NCI, for instance, as the crypto index, it distorts the index. Right. Okay, so if you're adding USDC, it's, cash, it's, cash. Yeah, it's yeah. Dollar, the dollar variation. You're yeah. not, right? So, uh, so it doesn't have stable coins. It doesn't have security to you. And do you do any yield strategies at all? No. Very, very, very good. Very, and we only yeah. do asset management. Yeah. Uh, Hashtags is about fund management, asset management. That's it. We don't we don't do anything else, and it's only crypto, mm -hmm. right? And we're seeing now the effects of market players doing too many things, right? Oh, they're managing funds, but they're doing their prop trading on the side, and things are getting mixed, right? So uh, our mandate is to be a pure asset manager and really deliver to clients that exposure, just one exposure to the asset class without all the problems. You know, Bitcoin going up or down, I can live with that. I mm -hmm. can live with strange risks. Right, right. Uh, uh, two more questions before moving on to FTX is, so in uh, US stock market, there's the S&P 500, which has yeah. 500. Russell 3000 has 3000. They're about 19,000, 20,000 crypto products. So how many in your main uh, NASDAQ crypto product, how many uh, assets are there? Uh, today, it depends on Europe and, and the US, the conversation is a little bit different, but it's around 11. It's been 6, it's been 12, 12 okay, 13, okay. so it's rebalanced quarterly. And then what you're doing every quarter is looking who's staying in and who's going out. Yeah, right? yeah. So uh, the weights, they end up varying every day because that's, that's right. on our market cap. But what you do every quarter is seeing who's fitting the rules and who's... Uh, who's uh, and you see a lot of interesting rotation, especially on the smaller assets. Right. Okay. My next question is: You say you said FTT, the token of FTX, the exchange yeah. that has fallen, uh, didn't have that. That was a to token native to the exchange, yeah. uh, which turns out was quite illiquid compared, yeah. and it's used as collateral a lot. Um, Binance, the biggest exchange in the world, they also have a token called BNB, yeah. which you know it may be much better, but it is a similar model. Yeah. Uh, do you have BNB? We have BNB uh, in one of the indices mm -hmm. uh, because it fit the rules. Uh, yeah, okay. So that's that's the thing about indices. It's it's you know uh, sometimes you might have just like you might not have an asset that you wanted to be there. You might have an asset that some people are going to challenge. You say why is that asset there? Mm -hmm. well, the rules are rules. So w one thing that happened in the past is uh, in the first iteration of uh, the NCI, uh, XRP was there, right and mm -hmm. Right after, uh, you know, some months after that, you had, um, or I think it was in, because first we had our index and then that became the NASA Crypto Index. But I think it was just uh, before or around the launch of the NASA Crypto Index, you had uh, the SEC lawsuit. And then there's a material risk that this is considered security. Okay, so the index committee mm -hmm. uh, gather and say, okay, this doesn't fit the rules anymore. We have to take it out. Even if it's not, in the rebalancing period, it was it was you know an, uh, an isolated event at that time. So that's what the index manager is for: is to, to look at you know what the market is, how it fits into rules. These rules are very transparent. You can go into Nasdaq's website, Nasdaq Crypto Index NCI.com. I think it is. You can, you can look, you can see the, the full rules there, and anybody should be able to replicate that. And uh, mm -hmm. that's that's the the thing you know. 
from people who are not from the index world, uh, that, that point is very important. A good index is one you can replicate, that you know, a fund can replicate. If you have a, an index that has you know, 100 assets, 100 crypto assets today, that's not replicable. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes you're adding like a very small asset that's actually hurting the fund instead of, of you know, creating, even if that asset p performs very well, just the cost of trading it will uh, overperform its performance in a given period. Right. So it's not about having the largest number of assets. It's assets that together make sense to represent the market. And particularly those small cap projects, when the market's doing well, they can be quite liquid. But when yeah. the market is in a bear market, they can be extremely liquid. Yeah. So that's, you know, that then then it's the index adjusts itself. You're yeah. looking, yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes going to have, you know, a big portion of the index is sometimes going to be very small. We had it, assets come and go. Uh, we had it, assets, you know, in the first generation of the index when it was our index, uh, the hashtag uh, uh, digital assets index back in 2018, you had several assets that are not there anymore. Uh, and some projects died, some projects, you know, really grew. Uh, the indexes, you know, if you look at over time, you see it capturing those movements. So that does the interesting thing. Yeah, indexation is a powerful tool in finance and it's actually been so successful in traditional finance that, that some people actually say it's it's too big and you know over half of stocks in the US for example are passively invested so you yeah. invest in a retirement plan it automatically oh six percent into Apple four percent into Microsoft and you know some people critique that and that that's because it's so powerful but in crypto I imagine that passive indexation is a tiny tiny fraction of that what what percentage of you know the 800 billion market is is a passively or semi-passive fund like yourself Oh, it's it's very small. If you look at uh, let, let's take a good example, uh, which is Europe. Europe has a very developed uh, market for crypto ETPs. The basket products are six percent of mm -hmm. the whole market. The rest is in single assets, but it's growing, mm -hmm. and it's growing because it's what makes sense, right? Uh, say you're a U.S. investor, you want to invest in China. You know, you don't have time to, or the skills to understand. You know, are you buying Alibaba, Tencent, this or that? Uh, which you know, I want. I'm interested in that segment, in that country, in that market. Then you buy the index, right? With crypto, even more. Uh, crypto, it's it's you know, it's tech on top of you know all these these uh, complicated things together. The average investor doesn't have the time or the skills to understand uh, and have a proper allocation. So that's when the index comes in and says, okay, this you know, and, and as the market develops, we're going to see more and more of this. Uh, you know, Brazil, I think, is an interesting example. The basket products, because of us, uh, the index are a lot bigger than the Bitcoin and Ether products, hmm. because that's yeah, the yeah. message that we sent to the market. Say, hey, you want to invest? This is the way you're going to get Bitcoin exposure. You're going to get Ether exposure, but you're also getting exposure to the rest of the market as it fluctuates. And in some periods, it's going to outperform uh, Bitcoin and Ether, the other assets together. The index outperforms Bitcoin and Ether, right? So that's uh, we, we think it's inevitable that that, that will happen because it's uh, it's a, a more intelligent way of investing. Mm. So let's just assume, for example, that you're right, that uh, indexation will become a larger and larger percentage of crypto, given that it's so tiny now. Whose lunch are you going to eat? There's the CFI world exchanges like Coinbase, Binance, and also FTX, which has fallen. And uh, then there's DeFi, where people can hold it uh, off exchange and cold storage. Uh, which do you think is which model do you think is more more vulnerable? And you know, to ask you a uh, Another question, do you think that the fall of FTX and just the scandal and, in my opinion, fraud, not official fraud, but in my opinion, fraud, uh, invalidates to some degree the centralized exchange model? Uh, in terms of who's lunch we're eating, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's even more interesting. We're just opening up new venues that weren't there before. Uh, it, it's We're creating uh, bridges for capital to access the crypto ec ecosystem that wouldn't come otherwise. Okay, so I mentioned, you know, my father invests in our funds. He w wouldn't open an account in, in exchange. So this is money that would be going into some fixed income product, some equity product, and it's going into crypto, right? So uh, it's not that clear cut. Uh, of course, you know, you, you look at the countries in which you have a big presence, then we're competing against exchanges, right? Brazil's a good example. Well, well you know, we're most periods were number two in volumes, mm -hmm. uh, considering crypto exchanges too. Uh, which means the clients are going to the stock exchange to trade crypto. Uh, that so so you know it's it's not so so obvious saying okay I'm taking out let's say assets that would be going to BlackRock or assets that would mm -hmm. be going to Coinbase. 
So uh, I think the idea is maybe a better idea is we're taking money from other asset classes and channeling them into crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's one thing. In terms of centralized exchanges, they're always going to be there. I, I think there's a, you know, when we talk about centra centralization, decentralization, it's, you know, sometimes there's a, an impression that, you know, we can go to a fully decentralized world. That's not going to happen. Uh, you need, you're, you need, a, you need centralization in very, uh, in various points, especially the way, you know, the financial industry is built. What we do need is better centralized agents and, and the better centralized agents, they come from market surveillance regulation, but also from, from public, from the public choosing where they're putting their money, who they're trusting, uh, you know, who are they empowering to be a centralized agent. Right. If you're in the bank, you don't like the bank. You don't like what it does to the world. Why is your money in that bank? Right. Uh, if you don't like the service, why is it there? The same thing works in crypto. Uh, if you don't like the way that given exchange behaves, if you don't like, you know, what it stands for, if you don't like this or that, even if the UX is great, even if the UI is mm -hmm. great, uh, you know, then then it's around us putting our money where our mouth is and say, OK, I choose deliberately to work with this exchange, not because uh, I think my assets are going to be safer. And remember, you know, never store your assets in exchanges. Never, you know, leave your private keys there. Uh, yeah, yeah. But if you're, you know, where you're choosing to trade, uh, especially that, you know, because if you're choosing to trade, you know, trading is trading. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're doing your own custody. So if you're choosing to trade, choose those that you think are representing something good and, you know, empower them. So I think then it's, it's up to the market, you know, I can speak for hashtags in that respect. When we're choosing our current parties and service providers, uh, those are the choices that we're making. So we're, we're not doing business with these guys. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't want to do business. We want to do business with serious people and that, that you know, are not positive for the market in the long run, right? So it's, it's, then it's up to us as an ecosystem to eat out the bad actors, right? Uh, where does that leave us in terms of, of what happened to FTX? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's an industry flaw. We can, we can point fingers at SBF as much as we want to, but how did we as an industry let this happen? Where are the points of flaw? You could say, oh, you know, U.S. regulation, this and that. Okay, but yeah, yeah. what about us? And when I, when I mean us, uh, I mean entrepreneurs in the sector, VCs in the sector. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't blame the final client. The final client wants to have, you know, easy services. And, and that's, and FTX was, was giving them that. How did we enable those things to happen, right? So I think that's, oh, you know, it wasn't our experience. We, we, we never dealt with FTX, but, you know, people that had doubts about Alameda FTX. Now we're seeing all of these pundits saying, oh, I yeah, knew yeah, this. I, I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, well, you, well, you knew it. You never brought it up. Yeah. Right. You never brought it up. You never made a, a compelling case about it. And there are ways of, of bringing these things up, especially in the U.S., without being hammered by lawsuits. And there are ways, you know, there are ways. Uh, so, so uh, you can be careful and still expose something that's problematic. Right. So. I think uh, we have to do a better job. You know, FTX has set us back several years uh, as an industry. Uh, I was talking to, to someone here in the event about this, the way, you know, uh, investments in the sector will dry up for some time. This is not, you know, a two month thing. This is, is going to, you know, take more time for things to settle. And, and it's our flaws as an industry. You know, so as we mature, so when we're in this adolescence, we have to become grown ups. And becoming grown-ups sometimes involves centralized parties, and that's fine. That's okay. You know, we're not going to die because you have a couple of big players. Right? And so you want to work with centralized parties who you can trust. What are red flags? So you said you never traded with FTX. What were red flags? Or I don't know if it was a red flag that said, yeah. you know what, maybe not. Yeah. Well, I can't speak specifically about FTX. This is uh, this was you know to to our off scene, but but there are some certain things that we look for. First is regulation. Where are you regulating? Mm -hmm. Right. Do you have a very clear regulatory framework? Do you have so so things that people complain about? Right. They they help. It's not that they solve yeah. everything, but you look at the bit license. Everybody likes to trash the bit license. Yeah. But you know, if a company has a bit license, there's some form of over oversight that you don't have for just some exchange trading out of Seychelles. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so jurisdictions, the U.S. is that's a jurisdiction. US, what, are, what are other jurisdictions that you view as sort of blue chip? I imagine uh, not the Bahamas, you know. Yeah, you know. My word's not yours. No, it's 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 <laughs> the it's going to be usual suspects. It's not, you know. 
it's it's not about a country being better than others. It's just countries in which financial markets are more developed. Right. They tend to have had more problems in the past, and thus regulation is stricter. Right. So, of course, U.S., Europe, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, uh, you know, a whole lot, Brazil, for that matter. You know, countries like that. You know, there's 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 institutions. There's you know, judicial system. You you can look at things and know how they work. So. Uh, where an exchange, where you know, counterparties regulated, how they work, and so on and so forth. Uh, on our trading side, we do most trading OTC with mm. large ah. uh, OTCs that are in traditional finance as well, right? So uh, the, these are guys that trade equity. They also trade crypto, and they have a long history, and they have trillions of dollars in, in, in transactions a year. So you can look at things and say, oh, this, is a, this isn't some strange company that came out of nowhere. Right. So uh, on top of that, you know, regulation, regulation implies that the company will also need to have thorough KC, AML. You know, mm-hmm. how, how are you dealing with stuff? KYT. Uh, and then it's up to us as as, you know, a client to do uh, the due diligence, look under the hood and say, OK, these are guys that we can trust and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So we know a, a good service provider when you're doing due diligence on them, they're doing strict due diligence on you. And in the end, they're like, okay, we're, we're happy with each other. We can trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think it's up to, uh, to companies, to crypto companies when they're choosing, really doing that uh, effort of, and, and then of course, things like funding, who's the team, you're still going to have false positives. SBF yeah. was certainly, you know, FTX was certainly a case. You had great backers. He's all over the media. You're like, oh, this yes. looks... This looks legit from an institutional perspective from the outside. Yeah, I think a lot yeah. of people are, including you know, very sophisticated people, are influenced by what they see in the media. And I think yeah. the uh, media was very welcome to SVF. So media, yeah. you know, as, as part of the media, I think that that definitely um, yeah. uh, played played a role. So do you um, do do any trading on decentralized exchanges, DEXs? No. No. Okay. So so in hash yeah. hash DEX, yeah. the DEX does not stand for decentralized. Index. It stands for index. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Index. So. Uh, and, and just one thing to wrap up, like uh, on how you, you can, you know, in the end it's about due diligence, but the big thing is you have to be paranoid. If you're paranoid in the constantly state of mild paranoia, uh, you're going to avoid these bullets. Yeah. Right. And we, all of us in crypto know that, you know, if you survive over time, uh, you can become something like Coinbase, right? Surviving over time, like. Brian Armstrong, you know, puts it. So, uh, being that level, having that level of attention, looking at stuff, and say, okay, there's this is the path forward. Let's change this provider. Let's change. This. So, you know, you're constantly evolving with your service providers and diversifying, and and then it's around risk management. So it's a great risk. You know, when you talk about 3AC, mm-hmm. FTX, and and so many other players, will lack their, or you know, not mentioning fraud and things like that. Yeah, but. Basic risk management. Leverage. Yeah, risk management. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if you're managing your risk correctly, you know, there are different ways you can portray what happened at, at, at FTX Alameda. Truth of the matter is they managed their risk so badly that they lost a very big business, healthy business that was FTX the exchange, mm-hmm. a money-making business, right? So that's very poor risk management. Like even if you had all the other stuff that was run, couldn't you have fixed that before, but, but you know, then, then we're getting to the details. But uh, how do you manage risks to avoid uh, client exposure, uh, firm exposure, your personal exposure, right? So, so it's, um, it's around that. And if you, then you have to come from a compliance perspective, as boring as that is. That's what saves you in the, in the end of the day. So, you know, being close to a regulator, understanding what they need, uh, doing your part and pushing the envelope in the right direction. You know, when we say we launched the first uh, crypto ETF in the world because we sat down with regulators, explain what we're doing. OK, so let's push this. So we're doing our, our little part in that segment of that bridge between crypto and, and TradFi. Like everyone has to do their part of keeping pushing and in the right direction. Right. So uh, I think it's it's something around that. Yeah. Mm. And so your products that are listed in Brazil, can only Brazilian investors buy them or US, Europe or? Yeah, foreign investors can access today. Any investor can access any market, but what you normally see is professional investors 
accessing markets abroad, right? You, you have a tendency to trade in your home country. Mm-hmm. So we do have institutional, large institutional investors that trade our products in Brazil. It's not aimed at them. It's not aimed at U.S. retail. Uh, but you do see, for instance, in the U.S., investors trading in Canada, for instance, and, and the Canadian uh, ETFs. Uh, but it's mostly for foreign foreign institutional investors and local institutional and retail, and our base today is something around 40% institutional, 60% retail. Mm. Yeah. So my final question, Bruno, what is the role of leverage in crypto? It sounds like what you have at Hashdex is very limited amount of leverage or, or no, zero. zero leverage. Yeah, zero leverage. That's what I thought about it. You know, yeah. um, and it, a lot of 2020 and 2021 in the, the bull market, we're, we're realizing uh, a lot of it was leverage and now sort of the leverage is unwinding. So yeah, do you think that leverage is a net positive, net negative? Do you think it's, it's positive, but it just was excessive? Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. It, it, what are people looking for? You know, one thing that we have told our clients from the beginning, even institutional clients, is, you know, instead of trying to maximize your gains with crypto, if this is an asset that can become 100x in 10 years, I don't know, you know, let's say Bitcoin goes to a million uh, or or it has or it goes to 200,000 or 100,000, 5x, 10x, whatever. Uh, Why do you want to risk everything? to have 150 instead of 100. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make sense, right? Uh, of course, there are ways of, of doing leverage that you're managing the risk well. It's not what we've seen. It's yeah. not what we're seeing in crypto over and over again. And then it can you can get back to basic greed and stuff like that. Uh, but you're seeing the, you know, the main crypto hedge funds, uh, large crypto hedge funds, really taking a hit in their head, uh, trying to you know, manage that stuff. Because it's hard. It's hard in traditional finance. It's even harder in crypto. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is it a, a, a net positive? Right now, I don't think it is. I, I, I think a lot of the problems that we have wouldn't be there if people weren't so leveraged. I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very positive about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a space for, for futures contracts? Of course there is. Like right. that. You use that to actually allocate risk differently and to manage risk and to hedge yourself. So, you know... Uh, then it goes back to a portfolio manager that has the right combination of understanding crypto, understanding potential, having that, you know, to be in crypto, you have to be a little bit uh, aggressive to give up your career, successful career somewhere else and, and, and try to be in crypto, but with the level of conservatism that you're not blowing up the house. Mm-hmm. And that balance is really not there yet. Unfortunately, you know, for every uh, investor that we're seeing doing that nicely, you're seeing the big blow ups like 3AC. So, um uh, then you know growing pains uh it, it's it's a shame that the growing pains of the industry in the end end up hurting uh final investors that had nothing to do with that you know and in three arrows capital is, a, is an interesting example because okay you can say oh their lps were institutional investors or big boys you know what they're doing yes but the fallout it's it's you know all these things right. are connected and it's getting to the, the the small investor there that had exposure to ftx Right. Yeah. So so there's a, a level and, and you know, people love to complain about regulators and and and, 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 and yes, and, and you can look I know and exactly you, what you mean. Yeah. And, and you can see the bridge and say, OK, like the gap and say, oh, it's too wide. They, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand. Yeah. Yes. But they understand consumer protection. And that's where they're coming from. Yeah. They say, you know, you have to behave better. And you can say, oh, you failed in 2008. Yes. Uh, that, that's, you know, everybody knows that. Uh, but understand where people are coming from. And, you know, if we can do from our side of the aisle, understanding where they're coming from, and there's that level on the other side. And there are people in DC, for instance, that understand crypto, that like crypto, and want to get it across the line, then you can have a conversation. But, you know, if you're from the crypto side just saying, we're going to blow up the system, okay, you, we're blowing up the system. Like, people are not liking it. Right. So it has to be careful. It has to be careful. It's step by step. You know, we're going to get there. Uh, we saw some great folks talking today about, you know, <laughs> the long run and and being there. And what matters is that these projects come to fruition and see the light of day. Mm. Right. If we mess things up, uh, we let's say I'm talking about crypto entrepreneurs on the right. service provider side. Uh, if the financial side of things 
blows everything up, we're going to see incredible tech projects not coming to life. And these are the projects that are going to change people's lives. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we're a tight pack that make things work and that protect investors in the end. Thank, Thank you, Bruno. I'm sorry. It's one final question. The lightning okay. round, lightning round is GBTC now trading at an immense discount. And it really is at the, in my opinion, the eye of the storm of a lot of the contagion because people were uh, minting GBTC and they were buying it. Uh, Three Arrows Capital owned like 6% of it. You said to me earlier, you don't think GBTC ever becomes an ETF. If that happens, I mean, what does it mean? Because what does it mean to own a trust that owns Bitcoin if you can never convert it? And, and what are the, why do you think it will never convert? And what are the knock-on effects of that? Well, there's no precedent of that conversion. So will it never be converted? You know, it's uh, it would be something unprecedented. Uh, of course, it has happened before with uh, in capital markets. Uh, I'm I'm pretty confident it's not going to be the first one. Uh, that that's I I I'll put my money on that. Uh, there is a scenario. You know, the GBTC structure and what it carries. This has never happened before. So there is a scenario which is the one that we're seeing that it just just goes on and this discount continues. Yeah. You know, we had the premium before. It flipped when you started seeing uh, the ETFs in Canada. You started seeing other products come up, and that trade stopped being so interesting. Now we have a discount that okay, now it's, you know, is it going to be converted? It's, you know, uh, and now uh, people are speculating on whether you know it, it's going to be dissolved. And oh, is this? It, they're trading that. Yeah. So you, it's become a parallel thing. That has <laughs> yeah. little little correlation with what, what Bitcoin is. Well, it you know it's a product that had its importance when it was created. Uh, it was an advance, you know, at the time, and and it it, it allowed access to some investors that couldn't have access anymore. But we can say that the structure is obsolete. It doesn't make sense today. This is this is common sense in the market, and I, I think a lot of it. I'd point to many of the things that the Ryan Selka says about this. You know. Mm. This is hurting investors in the end. And this was caused by flaws in U.S. regulation. So I think it's up to U.S. regulators, especially in this case, the SEC, to find a solution for this at some point. You know, because otherwise it's a stalemate forever. Uh, so so how, do you, how do you deal with those interests? Are, are you going to allow conversion at some point, breaking with precedent and, and, and doing something that's ever been done before? Are you going to force... A dissolution. Are you going to see a shareholder a lawsuit uh, asking for a dissolution? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's something that's you know been ventilated. So, and in that case, people who they would realize the thing. So, if if you bought if Bitcoin stayed constant and you bought GBTC now, in the liquidation that theoretically would be good, right? Because that you would get all the Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a beautiful thing about the the ETF, and that's why people sometimes don't understand the discount. Is like the ETF, you have the authorized participant. It's creating. Yes. And, and exploding shares all the time. And, and then you're, you know, if there's a little premium, it kills it. If there's a little discount, it kills it. And it trades very close to the index, to the asset, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't have the redemptions, you get this very strange uh, thing. So, you know, uh, it's a bad product for investors today. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, people will come around it. Lots mm -hmm. of ideas being floated around. I don't see any <laughs> immediate solution. I don't see any solution uh, you know, imagining the GBTC continues and it's not to solve, yeah. you know, based on speculation that's been happening. I don't see a solution for it in the next year or so. There you go. Bruno, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.